accomplished which were written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. In speaking of our Lord's passion and death, the Catechism of the Council of Trent has this to say. Since nothing is so far above the reach of human reason as the mystery of the cross, the Lord immediately after the fall sees not both by figures and prophecies to signify the death by which his son was to die. In other words, that God the Son would become incarnate and be executed by crucifixion in order to redeem fallen man is something that nobody could have foreseen or known about unless God said it would happen. This he frequently did in the Old Testament. And it is to these Old Testament revelations that our Lord was referring to when he said to his disciples, all things shall be accomplished which were written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man. Lucky in this country to have the wonderful music of Handel, Handel's Messiah, which of course goes through a lot of the prophecies of our Lord. It's good to know that. It's a nice bit of our culture in this country as well. It helps us to know our scripture regarding our Lord too. So here our Lord is speaking in a general way about what the Old Testament foretold concerning his passion, but left it to his church to give the specifics. And she tells us that the passion and death were foretold in two ways, by figures and prophecies. Figures and prophecies. So the first way then is by what we call figures, also known as types. And these are persons or things which actually and literally existed in the Old Testament, but also serve as foreshadowing some other future person or thing. For example, Abel. Adam, after the fall, had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain was envious of Abel, so took him aside and murdered him. Abel is a type or figure of our Lord who, because of the envy of his brethren, namely the Jews at the time, was taken aside, so to speak, and killed. Another example of this is Isaac. Abraham, after waiting so long for a son, was finally granted one, but shortly thereafter God commanded him to take his son to Mount Moriah and there to sacrifice him. Abraham obeys God, takes Isaac with him, making him carry the wood of sacrifice on his back. When they get to Mount Moriah, Abraham, when about to sacrifice Isaac, is stopped by an angel who says to him <clears throat> that God is pleased with his faith and does not require this sacrifice of him. Abraham then sees a ram caught in a thicket, takes the ram and sacrifices it instead of Isaac. Isaac is a fantastic prefigurement of our Lord. Both were led to a mountain and had to carry the wood of the sacrifice on their backs. The difference is Isaac wasn't sacrificed, whereas our Lord was sacrificed instead of the animals of the Old Testament sacrifice. And these Old Testament sacrifices themselves seized and were replaced by our Lord's perfect sacrifice, which in a sense fulfilled them. In fact, the ram itself is a prefigurement of our Lord, for just as the ram was found and sacrificed with its head stuck in a thicket, so too was our Lord sacrificed with thorns stuck in his head. One final example we could give is the scapegoat. God had commanded Moses that once a year the high priest was to take a goat. He would whisper the sins of Israel into the ear of the goat, thus symbolizing that the goat now had the sins of Israel. The sins were then taken away from the people, and the goat was then released into the wilderness where it was devoured by animals. Our Lord is a scapegoat. He is the perfect fulfillment of the scapegoat, who took upon himself the sins of the world and was sacrificed in order that we might not suffer the punishment due to our sins. These prefigurements are obscure, though. You only get the links after the events have happened. Prophecies are a little more clear. In prophecies, God speaks to the prophets, and the prophet gives the message to the rest of the people. And when it comes to the prophecies concerning the passion, not only in the Old Testament are there prophecies concerning that the passion would happen, but also specific details were given of the passion. For example, the betrayal of Judas, by Judas rather. For when the man of peace in whom I trusted, that is Judas, who ate my bread, that is the Eucharist, was greatly, has greatly supplanted me. 
The same book of Psalms also foretold that our Lord would be put on trial. False witnesses would rise up against him and give contradictory testimony. Psalm 26, unjust witnesses have risen up against me and iniquity hath lied to itself. Another example from the book of Psalms, one in which our Lord said was a prophecy concerning him. When our Lord was on the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the ancient world, the Psalms were not numbered. We didn't have Psalm 31, 26 or whatever. So you wouldn't have known them in that way like we do now. Instead, the Psalms were referred to by their first line, their beginning. So Psalm 21, which our Lord quoted on the cross, begins with, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's a bit like we say the Magnificat now. My soul doth magnify the Lord, we might put it in English and refer to it in that way. So they did with the Psalms then. So our Lord is telling the people there on the cross when he quoted Psalm 21, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Our Lord is telling the people around him that this Psalm is being fulfilled right then and there. Verses 17 to 19, they have dug my hands and my feet, they have numbered all my bones, i.e. they have dug my hands and feet with nails. And St. John tells us that not a single bone of our Lord's was broken. Continuing, continuing on, it said, and they have looked and stared upon me, they have parted my garments amongst them, and upon my vesture they have cast lots, which we know is exactly what the Roman soldiers did. So with that preparation now leading us towards our Lord's sacrifice and to Calvary, that's what the season of Lent that we're about to begin does for us as well and helps us do. So now we're about to begin that great penitential season of Lent. And we are similar to the Jews of old, for they were in a time of preparation for the coming of our Lord to redeem them. So are we in a time of preparation to commemorate the events of the Passion and Resurrection? So like those Jews, we must prepare. And the church gives us three ways to do this. One, prayer, two, fasting, and three, almsgiving. So now is the time, if you haven't already, to formulate and work out a kind of Lenten plan using a bit of all of these things now. So let's briefly look at them. So one, prayer, especially those prayers which focus our minds on the passion. For example, the five sorrowful mysteries of the rosary, stations of the cross. Two, fasting. Our Lord suffered to redeem us, so it is only fitting that we should suffer something for him as well. Now, we want to pick, pick certain things that are doable and sustainable for the whole time during Lent as well. If we, if we say, right, I'm not going to eat for the whole of Lent or sleep, drink or anything like that, well, we're not going to make it, are we? We need to do something that's going to sort of uh, challenge us somewhat, but be doable and sustainable for the whole time including these three things, prayer, fasting, and lastly, almsgiving. For example, money to the poor, or spiritual almsgiving. For example, praying for the repose of the souls of purgatory, in purgatory, participating in the 40 days for life, praying for those poor and born children as well. And the idea is we wish to relieve our brethren of their burdens just as Christ relieved us of our burden of sin. If we make use of these three means, we will then be more ready to receive those graces which God wishes to give us this Lent, Holy Week, and Easter, when we see before us all things which will be accomplished, which were written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man. May God bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen.